Chapter 14. Steel Hooves. The stables were never meant to save any pony. Explosions. The world around me was rent apart by a castrophony of violet light and bombastic sound. Shocking heat followed by a roar of mighty thunder. The twilight darkness was annihilated by two bright brilliance. Time slowed to a crawl, as if sensory overload was causing my own brain to lag. Fire and shrapnel tore at me, sparks of pain igniting all over my body. The roar that filled the world died with a high-pitched whine as I lost my hearing. I was rooted in place, unable to make my body move, and blood spattered across my face as the pseudo-goddesses standing in front of me tore apart. The parts of her body savagely flung in every direction. I felt myself thrown to the ground, and Velvet Re Remedy covered me with her body, her shield forming around us with an ached slowness. I could feel a sickly warmth as her blood seeped down, mixing with mine. I only belated it because I realized that I was not the one being attacked. The second pseudo-goddesses were turning, wide-eyed, as she brought down her own magical barrier shield. But it was too late for her. The rapid-fire explosions that were killing Velvet Remedy and me, just by proximity, were ripping directly into the creature. The pseudo-goddess's shield ripped apart, fluctuated, and died before it could fully manifest. Then she too was consumed by the multiplying gate, blaze. Time snapped back as the rain of explosions momentarily stopped. My vision was warped. The afterimages of the creatures, their obliterating bodies, burning flesh, still into my mind. My ears still hadn't, hadn't heard nothing but a distant, nauseating buzz. But now I could see the source of the massive attack. And I had seen this thing before. It was the poster from the recruiting center, come to life before us. A pony completely concealed in steel-gray armor, even its tail. It was a mighty relic from the war. A steel ranger. A bright lamp on its forehead spotlighted its target and a huge gun on its right side of its monstrous battle saddle began to fire again. But the last pseudo-goddess had been given plenty of time to ring up her shield as her sisters were slaughtered, and the explosions, which I now saw were metal apples similar to those I had used on the dragon, only being fired at terrifying speeds, detonated against her shield while she stood aside, looking cozy, unconcerned, and only mildly pissed. The flames illuminated her midnight blue coat and sickly gray, green hair, and made her eyes sparkle like gateways to hell. Again, the Steel Ranger's grenade minigun stopped, and now a large box on the left side of his battle saddle sprung open, unleashing two rockets which arrowed through the air towards the creature, leaving cocktails of smoke in their wake. The pseudo-goddess merely lowered her head, a spark of light bursting from her horn. In an instant, the two rockets had reversed course. The Steel Ranger tried to step back, but there was no time. The rockets impacted directly into our armored would-be savior, and exploded, tossing the massive body back down the hill. The gr grass erupted into smoke and dirt and flame as the tumbling body bounced over several mines before coming to a stop, motionless and seemingly lifeless at the foot of the shack below. Velvet's weight bore down on me, we waited for the Steel Ranger to get up, and the world seemed to wait with us. While after long moments it did not stir, the pseudo-goddess strode for it. I could hear her laughter, even though my ears could hear nothing but that awful ringing. In the back of my mind, I realized I must have been right. Telepathy played a part in the pseudo-goddess's threat. I see now how the so-called mighty Alicorn Hunter has fallen. The majestic and cruel voice of the pseudo-goddess purred in my head. The goddess will be most pleased. 
the impact of those bullets created twin sparks of the pseudo goddess's shield, limping and bloody at the storm of fire and shrapnel. Calamity strode forward. I could see his mouth moving. Undoubtedly, he was saying something snide and witty. The pseudo goddess, or Alicorn by her own title, turned and snorted diversely. Calamity shot again to just as futile an effect. I shrugged my haunches, trying to tell Velvet Remedy to get off me, but she did not. Her body was warm, dead weight, and I realized her shield spell had dropped. I felt a surge of panic. I heaved, rolling her off, and turned to find my beautiful companion unconscious. Her hide flayed with shrapnel, bleeding excessively. With a flare of my horn, I opened one of her medical boxes and started pulling out what supplies I had left. My heart screamed at seeing how little it was. I may have to scream too, but I couldn't hear. I pulled open the other, hoping for more, but all that was in the second medical box was a dress, a bottle of buck, and the party time menthols. That voice in my head roared. Velvet Remedy was counting on me. If she, She'd die if I couldn't help her. And I needed to be smarter right now. I needed to be able to be better right now. I needed those mentals. The little memory orb rolled out and fell into the grass as I tore the tin of party time mentals from her saddle box and floated it to me. A craving hit me, and I had to force myself to only take one. Make them last. One would be... The world became so much brighter, clearer, cleaner. I was aware of each raindrop as it struck me. I was aware of each pain and each bleeding gash on my own body. My mind sped down pathways of thought. Once again, brilliant light burst all around us, this time carrying the choking stench of ozone as the alicorn summoned lightning from the thunderclouds and struck calamity to the ground. I turned, trying to cry out, but I had no voice. Or I did, but just couldn't hear it. Calamity shuddered, twitching on the ground. He was not dead, not even unconscious, but he was in no condition to fight. The alicorn didn't seem to care. A malicious smile broke over her features, cold and wicked, as motes of pinkish-purple light ignited around her head, glowing and shaping into magical arrows. I tried to get my hooves to work, but my legs didn't work. A wave of feeling nausea dropped on me. I knew I too was suffering from the loss of blood, and the ringing in my ears was shredding my sense of balance. I also knew that Calamity and Velvet were about to die. So might I, but I would die saving them. And in the sheer brilliance of the mental enhanced Acurum, I knew just how to do it. My telekinesis did not fail me, even when my body did. I brought my sniper rifle with, to me, and I simultaneously lifted the memory orb and floated it towards the alicorn, moving it so that it approached her flank. I felt a pang of conscience, risking something so precious to velvet. The pseudo goddess turned, catching the movement out of the corner of her eye. She reacted before she recognized it, expecting a grenade, focusing her magical energy against it, and sending it hurling back at me. The memory orb glowed softly and the alicorn touched it with focused magic. Her eyes went wide, and she dropped, her shield dropped, and the forming cascade of magical arrows evaporated as the alicorn was lost inside the memory. Zipping into targeting Zen of Sats, I lined up the headshot and pulled the trigger. No! Velvet Remedy intonally harsh. Her voice sounded distant and muffled through a blaze in my ears. She floated the tin of party time mentals away from me before I had a chance to take yet another. I'd taken two already. One before killing the alicorn, and a second to stave off the massive depression that I knew would come when the first wore off. But I tried to come up with something that Velvet Remedy would buy. I was amazing now. I could talk anyone into anything. At least let me hold on to them. 
I might need them. And yet, somehow, I couldn't convince the most beautiful mare in the wasteland to let me keep a tin full of medicine. I'd administered the last of the medical potions to Velvet Remedy. The magical liquid seemed to work achingly slowly at closing her wounds. And now, she was left with just the healing bandages to aid Calamity and myself. We didn't have anywhere near enough. She was still very weak from the loss of blood, and was having trouble standing. Calamity needed a medical brace to fix his leg, and Velvet Remedy didn't want to risk a mending spell until it was set properly. More, he needed serious bed rest to recover from the lightning strike. And there was one more. I had to wave Velvet Remedy back before I approached the unmoving armored figure, crumpled against the shack below. Harnessing my levitation, I could pass over the minefield safely. Velvet Remedy could not. Between the Olicorn's thought words and the label my pit buck had spontaneously given the shack, I didn't take party time mentals enhanced smart to realize this had probably been steel hooves. The great Olicorn hunter, meaning there was more of those these. Probably a lot more. The threat was frightening. Steel Hooves had exterminated two of them in a combination of surprise and epic firepower. It was by wits and luck that I had killed the third before she slew us. Last time, I needed a boxcar. These creatures were not invincible, but they were powerful and very hard to kill. The Metal Stallion or at least I was assuming Stallion, based on the form of the armor, had not moved since the battle. I crouched down next to the fallen ranger, several of my bandages shifting and coming undone as I did so, my wounds oozing blood. Up close, the armor was even more impressive. It had its own air infiltration system, complete left support, even mechanized drug injection. The damage from the rockets was far less than it had any right to be. But still, the armor had a cave in the point of impact, gruesomely crushing the pony inside. I tried to find a way to remove the helmet. If there was one, it was well concealed. But I found a jackpot, or a jackpoint, that would allow my pit buck to interface with the helmet's own arcane technology matrix. I pulled out a tool from my utility barding, already suspecting the helmet included its own EFS. And SATs, equivalents, if not more. Whoever had designed the armor must have worked tail twin with tail alongside stable tech. Don't do that. The voice inside the helmet was low, rumbling, exceptionally masculine. I jumped back, startled. There was some pony alive in there. Fueled by part time confidence, approached, tried to reassure him. I'm a certified stable tech, pit buck technician. I lied, only a little, but I'm sure I can help. No, you can't, the voice spoke, but the body still did not move. The helmet did not even turn to look at me. My armor took a crippling hit, everything is offline. Medical, self-repair, the entire spell matrix has crashed. I sat back on my haunches, wincing as every drop, sharp bolts of pain lashed up to my flanks. Can you? With magical power, I cannot even move. I will die here. I am truly already dead. The low voice in the armor sounded resigned to the idea, and at peace with it. But I took him with me, and if I'm not mistaken, I saved the stable dweller. As a final fat act, it was a good one. I was taken aback. My overblown reputation, a deep discomfort stirred inside me. It wasn't right for other ponies to risk their lives for me, thinking of me as something special. I stared at the Steel Ranger, not dead, but paralyzed. If the armor had no power, jacking into it 
wouldn't do any good. I looked back towards Velvet Remedy, wishing I had actually taken some time to learn more about medicine from her, rather than just relying on her skills. I contemplated lifting her over the minefield. Turning back to the fallen armored pony. Okay. Steel hooves, right? How did you... Oh, of course. Of course what? Shaking off the confusion, I continued. I'm bringing our medic over. Thought another word, I turned and focused my magic on Velvet Remedy. She floated into the air with a shocked eep. She started to float through the air towards us. Little Pip, put me down! Minefield, I said casually. Okay, move me, then put me down. A moment later, she had joined us. She gave me a ladylike knicker and turned to look over the armored hunter as I informed her of what he had told me. My mind flashed to the poster I had seen on the wall of, the clin of Candy's clinic. You don't have to be a steel ranger to be a hero. Join the Ministry of Peace today. I looked at Velvet Remedy, knowing she must be familiar with the same poster from somewhere, and wondered if she was remembering it as well. You need not bother, Steel Hooves insisted. There's nothing to be done. I've had a good gallop. Nonsense, Velvet Remedy neighed, brushing out the Steel Ranger's morbidity. Now, we just have to get you out. No, the low gravelly voice said again. Sorry, Velvet asked, confused. She spent several minutes examining the armor, looking increasingly worried. Even if the armor protected you from burns and slashes, you suffered massive blunt trauma. The internal damage could... As she spoke, she began to wrap the armor in a soft magical glow. Don't remove my armor. Velvet Remedy whined. Oh, please. I just went through this with Calamity. I can't treat you if I can't see you. If you remove my armor, I will die. I blinked, gaping at him eyeing the huge dent, crushing into his side. I didn't process Velvet Remedy's magical ins medical insight, but I can imagine the armor was the only thing holding him together. Velvet pulled back, canceling her spell. Well, that seems like a design flaw. The armor is meant to keep me alive, Seal Hooves said, a touch defensively. I opened the armor plate over my left flank. Velvet Remedy did so, revealing a system of, for administrating drugs and medical potions. Everything from Buck to... I don't even recognize some of these drugs, Velvet said in surprise. The armor has a doctor enhancement. If it was working, I would be fully healed by now. I was looking over the injection system, casually observing. It doesn't have a system for party... Little Pip! Velvet Remedy scowled. Silencing me. I stepped back, cowering. I turned my mind from the drugs, instead focusing on the failure of the magical powered armor spell matrix. If this was a pit buck, I could easily... Wait, I blurted, already knowing exactly what to do. The old remedy gave me a look. Little pip, she hissed angrily. I couldn't blame her. It had been only a second since I made the, another observation. She didn't have any application or appreciation for how fast I could think right now. And if she did, maybe she wouldn't be so fast to take my party time mentals away. Now, no, I know how to fix him. I can restore power to the armor and reboot the spell matrix, I beamed. The suit designer obviously incorporated stable tech arcane technology. And it's not really different from fixing a pit buck. Velvet's expression softened. Well then, don't just stand there, she smiled, backing out of my way, careful not to move closer to the minefield. I trotted forward and came crashing back to reality. Recognition of my mistake mixed with the crushing depression that flooded me in the wake of party time mentals was wearing off. In a moment, I was stupid, ignorant, and dumb. Um. 
I... I can't. I moaned. But you just said... I don't have the tools. I felt like crying. The Steel Ranger was going to die, imprisoned in his armor, because I wasn't a certified stable tech buck, pit buck technician. My utility barding didn't include a spell matrix master key. Reluctantly, I admitted as much. Velvet Remedy walked to me, wobbling a little, still faint from loss of blood. She wrapped her tail over me, whisperingly, whispering comfortably into my ear. A spell matrix master key? The voice of Steel Hooves sounded hopeful, rather than resigned. You might be able to find one in Stable 29. We were going into another stable. I felt myself tremble at the thought. My apprehension more than my physical weakness. I assumed. Velvet Remedy had rebound my wounds. Clemity limped up to me. Remember, little Pip, this isn't your stable. I nodded. I was still in the grips of post-PTM depression. I knew I wasn't in any condition, mentally, to be doing this. But Steel Hooves needed the help, and we owed him. I've changed my mind, the Steel Ranger protested. I can't allow you to go into a stable for me. His sense of hope had swiftly been squelched by a stubborn nobility that both I understood and rejected. I wasn't the only one. Oh? Well then, come right over here and stop us, Velvet Remedy suggested, then added, Oh right, you can't. Your bedside manner is horrible, the voice from inside the armor reported. I looked at the three of us. We were in no condition to travel into unknown and likely hostile territory. Each one of us could barely stand. I won't tell you where the entrance is, Steel Hooves dissuaded, said dissuasively. Clemity whined. Point hole cover marked Stable 29, near the Fetlock passenger wagon stop. Steel Hooves pointedly said nothing. Clemity leaned over and whispered and Velvet Remedy thought there was nothing interesting under the passenger car wagon. It took us much longer to reach than I remembered. We were moving gingerly, avoiding marks of red on my EFS compass, and right now, I felt a few rad roaches could finish us off. Calamity was flying, keeping all weight off his leg. He looked at the passenger wagon, and announced too cheerfully, Well... I hope your levitation is back to its full impressiveness, little Pip. Unless we found a flux regulator, and no pony told me, moving that thing will be up to you. I laid down. I needed to focus fully on the passenger wagon. Sky banished stages, I noted, pointlessly. And that meant not diverting my energies into remaining upright. My horn lit up as I concentrated on the huge wagon. Magical power enveloped it and I pushed, converging all of my will into moving the vehicle. My horn flared. A layer of overglow burst around it. The wagon began to rock, groaning. Sweat broke across my forehead. I began to have trouble breathing. Somewhere distant, Love Remedy was being concerned, but I blocked it out. A second layer of overglow erupted from my horn, and the whole wagon lifted several feet into the air, and was shoved back onto the sidewalk. I let it down gently, and then collapsed, exhausted. I could see the pony hill cover. Yay. Sleep now. How long was I out? I asked, aghast. Long enough to get some much-needed sleep, Velvet soothed. I rested my eyes a little myself. We were in the short maintenance tunnel. On one end, a door led to an even more maintenance tunnels, and snaked all the way under Fetlock. On the other, three steps led up to the massive door of Stable 29. Calamity was standing on three hooves, his crippled forehoof lifted, 
and stared at the control mechanism. Well, this is a bust, he proclaimed. It looked like Stable 29 had never opened. And, without an override password, it was likely or unlikely that we'd be getting in. Still, I went to work at it. My mind felt sluggish, and I considered munching a part of time menthol. Even a non party flavor would help. But, I didn't want Velvet or Calamity to think I needed them. I didn't. They just made me better. After invading the control system and thoroughly probing it, I found something interesting. I think I found a back door. Where? Calamity asked, looking at the porny hole. Is it far? I shook my head. No, I mean, into the system. A three-part key is required to bypass the normal security. What kind of key? Velvet Remedy questioned. Voice recognition. Three different voices are required, I informed them. Then, before any pointy pointed out the fact that there were coincidentally three of us, I explained, it has to be the right three voices. What is being said doesn't need to matter. Just who's saying it. It was a very interesting back door at that. I wondered just what prompted such a design. And if all the stables had the same concept of security. Who's three voices? I thought a moment, and cursed how slow my brain was. Uh, um... I remembered the Stable 2's override code, CMC3BFF. I think I know. The first voice was the one that took the longest, simply because I didn't have a recording of it. Instead, we sat there listening to DJ Pwn3 on the radio, waiting for his selection of songs to cycle through. For the first and only time, I was actually grateful that his radio broadcast had such a limited selection of music. Good evening, Everypony. This is your humble host, DJ Pwn3, master of the airwaves. It is just about time for me to turn in. But first, good news. Looks like our Wasteland Crusader from Stable 2 is an equal opportunity savior. From the reports I'm getting, she and her, her companions helped out a bunch of raiders at Shattered Hooves from being enslaved and decimated by an attacking slaver army. And then, because you can't have a cupcake without icing, she killed a dragon. Luna, damn it. Why wasn't it ever Calamity and his companions, or Velvet Remedy and her entourage? Don't know if I agree with you on this one, kid. Saving raiders? Some monsters deserve to be enslaved. Perfect. Also, in the news... Got another report of hellhounds attacking travelers in the wastelands between Manhattan and Philadelphia. Honestly, ponies, if you have to travel that way, make sure you have the heavily armed escort. If you don't, just don't. This has been DJ Pwn3, Pony Survival Tip. Tune in for more tips in the series, including grenades aren't for eating, and raiders do not want to be your friend. But first, it's Sweetie Belle singing, The Dark Days Are Over. I leapt up. Here we go, ponies! Back at the controls, I fed the voice pattern recognition spell a few first lines of the song, mentally noting to record the song for use if I had the deep misfortune of having to enter a stable the third time. I followed with snippets of two recordings. The override code for opening the door to stable 2 is CMC3BBF. Hello! My name is Scootaloo. You probably know me, since I'm pretty famous, for my awesome performances at events like last year's Gallops, or maybe just some as the founder of the Red Racer. With a mighty hiss and a dragonic groan of protest, the door of Stable 29 began to move. I turned to find Velvet walking past me to face the door. The gorgeous mare had donned her beautiful dress and groomed her mane. I shot a look to Calamity, who merely shrugged. Um, Velvet? The dress hid most of her bandages. 
We're meeting ponies of another stable for the first time. We want to put our best hoof forward, she said, aristocratically. Especially if they've never seen outside visitors before. We want to look like diplomats. Her eyes moved to me, and without turning my, her head. If you two went in first, we'd look like invaders. The vast metal doors swung away, and Velvet Remedy stepped into Stable 29 without hesitation. Clemity limped up to me as I watched her disappear inside. She's really something, ain't she? Yes, I said, feeling a little dumbstruck. I glanced at Calamity, who was staring through the door at Velvet. She? I did a double take. Calamity wasn't looking at Velvet Remedy. He was looking at her. Something broke in my brain. No! No, that was just... No! No, he asked, confused, his eyes not leaving her haunches. I stammered, recovering. No, not no, I mean, yes. Yes, she is. She's... Mine. Damn it. This was not fair. I loved Velvet Remedy. I had since long before Calamity even met her. Yes, yes, I knew I didn't actually have a chance with her. She wasn't... She was her. And I was just... Me. And I knew all about swinging barn doors. But... Ugh! I took the mental image of Calamity successfully wooing Velvet Remedy when I could. Not... And shoved it into a deep, dark hole. And then filled that hole and built a house on top of it and on that hole and I moved into it. I focused instead on the pristine but extremely gorgeous interior of Stable 29. At first glance it looked perfectly preserved. A gasp from Velvet Remedy shattered that illusion. Velvet was backing away from the remaining skeletons dangling overhead from part of the door mechanism. Its midsection pulverized. Velvet wavered, looking about to faint. I grimaced, looking to Calamity, who rushed over to steady her. This was an ominous start. Two metal doors offered us two options. Maintenance, or atrium. My eyes forward sparkle was clear of any red. For that matter, it was completely clear of anything other than my two companions. There was no sign of life in the stable. At least, not within the range of my pit buck spell. The stable was utterly silent, save for the ever-present high-pitched hum of the lights and the gentle rumble of the generators. This place is a tomb, Calamity voiced. Maintenance should take us directly to the pit buck technician's stall. But the atrium would lead to the clinic, and we were in need of desperate medical supplies. On the off chance that there was something lurking in Stable 29, we needed the medical supplies before we did any wandering. I passed my logic onto Velvet Remedy and Calamity, and they both agreed. Calamity wincing as the hoof of the injured leg brushed the floor. I stepped forward, and the door of the atrium slid up. Stepping in, my eyes immediately fell on the skeletons of at least three dozen other ponies. They were strewn about the room, but the high concentration was right in my hooves. I had to use telekinesis to clear a path through the bones of the ponies. Lucky enough to have made it into a stable before the mega spell, mega spell destroyed Manhattan. I felt anger biting at the backs of my head. I reminded myself it wasn't my stable. There was a lot of other debris in the atrium as well. Bottles of beer and whiskey, scotch and wine, most of them empty and many shattered. Dresses and gentle ponies, and gentle pony wear, turned greasy with decay. In the far back, a sound system was riddled with bullet holes. Do you think they... 
Velvet's voice trailed off. She was looking behind us, just above the door we came through. Two automated security turrets were mounted on the wall. They had power, but they didn't seem to be tracking us. My EFS claimed they were not a threat, and the room suggested that, that has not always been the case. I looked up towards the circular window of the Overmare's office, only there wasn't one. The wall was blank and featureless where that window should be. The stairwell that should lead up to a security center and the Overmere's offices wasn't there, or was there, but it was simply labeled security. I found myself getting irrationally upset at the incorrectness of the stable's design, again. Behind me, I heard Calamity whispering to Velvet. She's had bad reactions to a stable before. What? Was I that oblivious? We better keep an eye on her. Oh, perfect. Now they were going to be my parents. Ugh. Okay. There doesn't seem to be any immediate danger, which is split up to save time. Velvet, why don't you raid the clinic? It was safe. I could see into the clinic through the atrium window. Calamity and I will head down to maintenance. Velvet Remedy argued. No, Calamity should stay with me. I barely kept myself from stomping. Velvet Remedy continued, simply. I want to mend that leg as soon as possible. I can use my magic to heal the bone once I have it set properly. Fine. I grumbled mentally. Then, sounding as pleasant, pleasant as I could, of course. No problem. I don't need any help finding the pit buck technician stall anyway. That is, assuming any of the rest of this place isn't laid out bizarrely. I'll be back before you're done. I started to trot back through the door. Velvet Remedy stopped me with a soft voice. Little Pip, are you alright? I waved a hoof. Oh yes, I'm just feeling a little drained. Blood loss, you know. I put on a good smile, and she looked like she was trying to be convinced. Okay. I'm a bit surprised, but, but I'm happy. It's a good thing that my two friends like each other. Clemity coughed. Wait, what? He nickered. She's a self-righteous, self-idolizing elitist who'd rather fix up our enemies than shoot them. Both Remini scowled at him. And he's an impulsive ruffian who thinks he can fix the wasteland by drowning it in blood. By the goddess. Could they be any more obvious? I left before I screamed. I spent the rest of the trip down through maintenance, reminding myself that this, it was actually a good thing that my friends got along. That it was stupid to be jealous when I had no real chance to begin with, and that if I wanted to keep those friends, I'd best bury these feelings into that same dark hole. I wondered just how long this was going on. Was it new? Had there been any signs that I was too oblivious to catch? Or had I just not wanted to catch them? The idea of catching them brought an entirely unwanted magical p image of Velvet and Calamity to my mind that I quickly shredded and burned. This was going to be hard. You know what would make things more cheerful for them? Easy? A little pony in my head waved a tin for me. Fuck that little pony. I wanted to wallow just a little longer. A light appeared on my EFS compass. It was not hostile. Did one of them come down here after me? If they did, how did they get ahead of me? A moment later, a maintenance bot hovered out of one of the stalls, its multiple limbs bobbling as it cleaned the walls. No wonder this place looked spotless. I felt a spark of annoyance that we didn't have the wall washing robot in Stable 2 maintenance. I had had to wash the walls of my stall by hoof. The robot started to clean in my direction, and I decided to get out of its way by ducking into the robotics technician stall. The room was filled with maintenance bots in various states of disrepair. 
There were enough tools here to upgrade Calamity's workshop plans. And I began looting. The robotics technician's back office had been burned black, and I found the charred skeletons of two ponies, along with a partially dismantled medical bot. From the looks of it, some pony had made a fatal error while working on it, causing the sanitary flamethrower to go off wildly. The maintenance bot passed by the hall. At the back of the burned office was a safe. The paint on the wall around it bubbled and peeled. The safe itself had feared nothing from the fire. I slipped on my screwdriver and a bobby pin, only to discover the safe wasn't locked. Already in a bad mood, I felt cheated. Inside was a flask of apple whiskey, a pouch of 200-year-old, old-fashioned, gourmet honey drops, a tin of sadly normal mintals, several maintenance card clipboards, and a recording. Leaving the clipboards, I downloaded the recording out of my pit buck and gave it a listen. This is Mender, reporting on diagnostic progress for Kenneth's household utility bot. I stayed up all night probing through his this thing's programming. I wanted to have this report ready in time for the funeral. From what I can tell, it looks like the robot suffered a glitch while receiving an automated update to its subroutines from Stable Tech. That's really the only explanation I have on how it gave Calamity, or not Calamity, Kenneth, a cup of steaming hot industrial solvent rather than coffee. All these pony folk who whispered old Kanakin was going to drink himself to death were probably choking on their words right now. If not, they should be. I saw the poor fellow before they incinerated him. His whole mouth and throat were eating, eaten away. I've had nightmares about it for days. I plan to talk to Shadow Warren later today. I want all the house helpers to be shut down until we can check each one of them. Of course, that's going to take some doing, and a lot of time. I know it's uncomely of me to use Kanakin's death to push my own agenda, but this is just another example of why I need an instable authority. How can the ponies of stable tech possibly expect to properly govern the stable if they're not here, seeing what's going on? That was unexpected, and gruesome. I tried to shove the mental image of Kanakin out of my head, cantering my thoughts instead on the idea of a stable without an overmare at all, a stable run remotely by stable tech. The Pipbuck technician's stall was right where it was supposed to be. I was surprised, relieved, and a touch annoyed that I should feel either. The technician spell matrix master key was locked away in a cabinet, along with a dozen other enchanted precious tools that mere apprentices like myself were not allowed access to. I floated out my screwdriver and a bobby pin once more. A few minutes later, my armored utility barding was fully loaded with everything I could need for advanced pit buck repair, and, at least in theory, everything necessary to restore the flow of magical power to Steel Hogue's armor. And just in case, I packed several spark batteries and a small magical field conducting array. The office of the stable head technician lacked the hammock that had so often bore my teacher's weight back in stable two. I shook my head, giving the stall one more look before leaving to rejoin my friends. I spotted an audio journal amongst the items scattered across the technician's desk. Sit here and play the journal, or trot back to find Velvet and Calamity, together, hopefully not kissing. Okay, journal it was. Shadowhorn called us to a meeting today, this morning. We nearly had a major disaster yesterday. That idiot Buckbright built his colt a BB gun for his birthday, then brought the kid down to the reactor level for target practice. What was he thinking? 
the kid missed a rad roach and punctured a small hole in the environmental system. Actually nicked the water talisman. Thankfully, it's working fine. Another half an inch and the whole stable would be in serious trouble. As head of maintenance, Shadowhorn laid down a whole new series of safety protocols. They aren't official until she gets them passed through stable tech, but we're going to follow them anyway. And if stable tech doesn't like some pony given the orders for them, well, they can trot themselves down here and say differently. Velvet Remedy pushed three jars of extra strength restoration potion over to me. Drink these. You'll be in perfect health in ten minutes. I was shocked. Shouldn't we take these with us? Use them sparingly? Velvet Remedy shook her head. She was looking a lot better, but she stowed away her dress and removed her bandages. Her hide was perfect, and her coat looked pristine and healthy. She had a couple IV bags draped over her haunches, with surgical tubing running to a spot beneath her left shoulder. No need. I've already stored a dozen more away for our travels, plus plenty of bandages, some braces, blood packs, and more. For the first time, we've positively flush with medical supplies. I'd say this clinic was a gift from the goddesses, but I know better. I raised an eyebrow as I floated the first potion to my lips. Velvet Remedy slid me a recording. I found this while I was requisitioning supplies. I smirked at her reluctance to call it looting or scavenging. I downed two of the extra strength restoration potions and slipped the third into my saddlebags. Memories of Velvet, her hide shredded and bloody, had resurfaced in my mind. I could handle being mostly healed if it meant I had one of these ready in case of an emergency. Calamity was also looking much better. He complained that after Velvet Remedy's mending spell, the brace wasn't really necessary but she insisted he keep it on for at least another day. I walked about the clinic, looking for a good spot to sit down and listen to the recording, and I frowned at it, expecting bad things. Recordings so rarely carry good things in equestrian wasteland, especially, it seemed, in stables. I found a chemistry lab in the back of the clinic, and for a moment, all thoughts about recording fled my mind. Looking over the drugs and supplies, I realized that along with what I already had, I had all the ingredients to cook up my own batch of party time menthols. And having the ability and opportunity, I couldn't resist. It would have been silly to. As I started working, I remembered why I had come back here. I loved the recording play as I ground down the regular, boring old party time menthols into a fine powder. Oh. The voice was so filled with raw despair that I quickly shut off the recording. I didn't want to hear that. I concentrated on my chem cooking for several long minutes. The recording just sitting there on the counter, staring balefully at me. Finally, with a huff, I turned it back on. How could this have happened? The doctor and I stepped out for a few minutes, and when we came back, the clinic had sealed itself, and the fire suppression system had activated flooding the entire clinic with... with... It took us over an hour to get it open again. We tried breaking through the window, but it's armored. Why would they armor the window? Every pony inside is choking to death. Lemongrass had only been in there to have her stitches out, and she was planning for her daughter's cute Sensinera this evening and had been talking with me on what flavor cake to get from the dispensers. The oranges knew cold was still in the clinic for nursery. Oh gosh, I don't think anybody's told them yet. I shut it off again. My heart was twisted up into knots. Part of me wanted to cry. Part wanted to rage at something. But there wasn't anything obvious to rage at. So I raised at the faucet, beating my hooves against it, 
for refusing to give me water. It was stupid, but it felt good. Finally, after pouring water from my canteen, I finished mixing the concoction and set it to bake. The sound of machine gun fire snapped me out of my attention. All thought of journals, mentals, and chemistry evaporated when I heard Velvet Remedy cry out. My friends were in trouble. As I turned, two red spots lit up on my EFS compass. The turrets had become hostile. Dashing back into the clinic, I saw Calamity and Velvet Remedy ducking under an overturned medical bench as the two turrets outside, above the now closed door, peppered the glass windows. Pock marks and spiderweb cracks covered every inch of it, and the armored glass was about to give. Floating out little Macintosh, I positioned myself where I'd be able to get and target them both the instant the glass came down. I didn't have much cover, but if I was fast and a little lucky, I wouldn't need it. The window broke apart with a tinking cascade. I felt the first bullet slammed in my chest, not quite puncturing through my armor as I gritted myself with sats and fired both turrets once, twice. A second bullet ripped through my foreleg before my pit buck and my by my pit buck and my knee as I fired off the first two shots. And the second. Blam! Blam! The first turret exploded. The second swept its arc of bullets away from Calamity and Velvet and towards me. Blam! Blam! One last bullet struck my side, bouncing off the handle of my combat shotgun with a loud crack as the second turret exploded. I collapsed, suddenly realizing that I was yet again in a truly bad amount of pain. But this time, I had no worries at all. I had Calamity and Velvet, Medi Velvet Remedy right nearby, and we were in a clinic. If I had to be shot, I couldn't think of any better place or better company. But as soon as I hit the floor, I struggled back into my hooves, ignoring my injuries. Limping and bleeding gladly, I tried to push back towards the chemistry lab. I had to make sure my pyrotime mentals didn't cook too far. And now that my friends were safe, mind locked on what had become a decidedly second but still important priority. The atrium door had closed and locked. We were sealed inside. It was more in aggravation than real worry. I knew that I should be able to override every door in this place from the security station. But reaching it meant getting past several more points where the suddenly trigger-happy sentry system could attack us. I looked at my companions. By now, I was beginning to think of us as seasoned warriors of the wasteland. Well, at least Calamity and I. I hadn't been out here long. But the time I had, I had been forging fire, if there ever was one. The few turrets shouldn't pose much threat to the Slayers of Dragons. I quickly checked myself. That kind of thought was dangerous. The last thing I needed was to start buying into the hype on the radio. And Velvet Remedy was looking at me sadly. I think I was fast enough. But if I was guessing that she suspected what I was up to in the chemistry lab. She hadn't taken her eyes off me since, and the reproachful look was burning into my mind. Calamity was gazing over something on the wall. At first, I assumed it was another pre-war poster. He was studying it with the same intensity that Velvet Remedy usually reserved for anything involving the Ministry of Peace. But as I moved closer, still slightly limping on my own mended and bandaged leg, I saw that it was a map of the stable. My eyes followed the path up the stairs to the security station. The armory was up there, as well as a series of rooms that in a proper stable would have been the overseer's personal and family quarters. Here it was labeled as VIP rooms. There was a big area of absolutely nothing where the overseer's office was supposed to be. My brow furrowed. I really hate these stables. Love Remedy was looking back over the skeletons, while keeping me in her line of sight. Was 
Was the other one you found this bad? Worse. Calamity nade. We moved towards the stairs, stopping at a bulletin board covered in the usual notices. I shrank back. Some pony had written, Stop killing us, across the board, in what looked like blood. Oh my. Velvet Remedy whispered. To my surprise, she magically tugged one of the notices off the board, floating it closer for inspection. The notice had been posting for new safety regulations, and a flyer for two missing fillies, whose smiling faces stared into an atrium of corpses for centuries. The bottom part of the N was painted on the sheet velvet had taken. I stared from the bulletin board to her, wondering how by Luna's mane she could find anything more noteworthy than the giant plea for mercy written in a dying pony's own blood fluids. Both Remedy turned the flyer so that Calamity I could see. Third month survival party. Tonight in the atrium. 10 o'clock to 16 o'clock. Stable 29's own vinyl scratch hosting. Alcohol will be provided after 12. Clemity whistled, tilting up his hat. Vinyl scratch? The original DJ Pwn 3, at least according to some. So, she survived the Manhattan Balefire bomb after all. I shot Clamity a look that suggested he needed to revisit his definition of survive. I really hated these stables. Between Stealth and Little Macintosh, the other turrets proved little threat. I reloaded as we pushed into the security station, and I sat down to hack the terminal, trying to be as respectful as I floated the pony skeleton off of it and laid it down in the corner near the others. Elder Remedy had begun saying prayers over them. Calamity trotted around to the armory, armory in the vein hoping he could open it without my skills. Discovering he couldn't, he turned away with a disappointed expression. I waited till he took a step away before opening the door remotely from the easily hacked terminal. He jumped and he shot me a grin and disappeared inside. A pretty good-natured revenge. I was still smelling carrots. I turned back to see a huge mess of security tapes and logs. Tentatively, I brought up one of the later ones. Entry 67. This is insane. Over half the population is dead. At first, we thought they were freak accidents. But now, it's clearly malevolent. It's like... The stable itself has turned against us. Yesterday, the school sealed itself, and the plasma was vented into the room. Twenty-three colts and fillies were murdered horribly, their bodies literally melting away. We could hear their screams. My nephew was in the class. he just gotten his cutie mark. He was going to grow up to be an artist. My sister can't stop crying. She locks herself in our room, with all the pictures she has of him. Some pony has to be responsible for this. Some pony has to pay. I found myself shaking, not from pain. And I commanded the security terminal to play one of the older ones. Entry 43. Shadowhorn passed away last night from complications after being nearly electrocuted yesterday morning while trying to access the junction behind a security panel with her pit buck. This, so soon after Buck Bright and his son were killed in that accident with a lift. This stable's a death trap. I hit another. Entry 72. It's stable tech. It has to be. Those fuckers, stable tech, have locked us up here in their little fucking death, death maze and are killing us off. It's not even one by one anymore. They're slaughtering us in groups. What kind of sadistic bastards could do this? They've killed children! Don't they realize we're the only chance for Ponykind? These stables were supposed to save us. 
What kind of evil saddle fuckers play murder games with the last surviving members of their own species? We can't even get at them. It's all done remotely. I brought up the next one. Ignoring Velvet Remedies, please, for me to stop. Entry 73. <laughs> Joke's on us, isn't it? It occurs to me that we don't actually know that the Mega Spells went off. We believe the world above has been destroyed because that's what Stable Tech has told us to believe. But what if it's not? All of Equestria is just going on about their daily lives in the sunny world above us while we scream and cry down here in some depraved amusement for the sick, soulless ponies of Stable Tech. It's the only thing that makes me even breathe in sense of this horror. I reached a trigger, yet another one, when Velvet Remedy physically pulled me away from the terminal. What? I yelled in pure rage, my body shaking so hard I felt I would explode. Little Pip, she said. I realized she was crying. You need to stop. Calamity and Velvet Remedy sent me off to look over the last two rooms. The VIP rooms, and while they turned off the security systems and opened up the doors. That was good. They wanted me to catch my breath. Calm down. I wanted to find a place away from them. And something to finally destroy. I was seeing red like never before. And I couldn't even attack the source of my anger. Because they were all dead. Dead decades and centuries ago, my body hadn't stopped shaking. The first room had a banner lit up above it. Vinyl Scratch. This was her room then. The original DJ Pump 3. I stepped forward, and the door slid open. The room inside had been untouched since the night of the party. Three months after the door of Stable 29 closed trapping everyone inside. I walked about, staring. Stacks of records, turntables, recording equipment, a rather luxurious, if small, space to eat and sleep. A private laboratory with a full body bath. I could throw quite a rage in here. The record was sadder, shattered beneath my hooves, quite enjoyably. But I couldn't do that. Destroying the things that had been loved by the ponies who lived here, ever so briefly, didn't feel like railing against the vile ponies that had been creating this place. Rather, it would be a continuation of their work. Instead, I collected a few records, slipping them into my saddlebags. When I returned to the others, I would have Velvet Remedy lock them in one of her medical boxes, where it would be safe from bullet fire. I still remembered that apple. There was a safe in the room. I hesitated. Somehow, it felt a little odd breaking into the safe of a celebrity. Even a long dead one. But with a long pause and a breath, I brought out my tools and set to work. Inside, I found an old child's toy, several framed photographs, and a handful of posters and one box that looked like it had been rescued from a fire. Inside were four memory orbs. One caught my eye. It was labeled, Pinkie Pie's Last Party. I took it, slimming it in my saddlebags, and walked into the next room. The sign over the door announced, Shadowhorn. The mayor in charge of the maintenance was a VIP in the stable. Even in the midst of my barely... Rain and fury at Stable Tech, my pure hatred towards whom could not be told. Part of my brain recognized that seemed odd. The door slid open for me, and I stepped in. This room was more disheveled. There were parts and scrap metal everywhere. Half finished project covered the table. Schematics from different stable systems were pinned to the wall. One of them had been torn away to reveal his room safe. Once again, I set to work. When the safe was opened, it revealed another recording. 
This one looked startlingly similar to the one I found in the Overmer Overstallion's office. I needed to hear it, but part of my mind seemed to scream to me not to. I didn't pay attention to that voice. Instead, I played the message, and another familiar voice burst into life of the tomb that was Stable 29. The voice sounded determined, but weary, and filled with sadness. She sounded like she was re reading a script that she had grown to hate. Hello, Shadowhorn. The following is for your ears only. I am speaking to you because you have been selected for a very important job. Due to your sense of loyalty and duty both to this company and the ponies around you. My name is Scootaloo. You probably know me. Who cares? I'm sick of these things. Try that again. Hello. My name is Scootaloo. And I'm the Vice President of Stable Tech. If you're hearing this, that means that the Omega Level Threat Protocols have been enacted and the citizens of Equestria chosen for Stable 29 have been safely sealed inside the most state-of-the-art apocalypse survival facilities I've created. I'm very sorry. I wish there was more we could do. Hell, I wish this whole thing could have been prevented. But instead, it falls to us to save who we can, and try to prevent it from happening ever again. To that end, your stable has been selected to participate in a vital social project. The first goal of Stable 29, like any other, is to save the lives of the ponies inside. But, but there is a higher purpose for your stable, beyond saving individual ponies. We here at Stable Tech Understand that it doesn't do pony kind any good to save ourselves. Now, only to annihilate each other later. We must figure out where we went wrong. We must find a better way. And, we must be ready to implement it as soon as possible once the stable doors open. And survive what our current leaders have managed to do to Equestria. Damn it. How did we come to this? Damn it. Damn it. Damn it! Well, I guess we came to this, maybe, because we're ponies. We try our best. We have the best intentions. But when things go wrong, we get flustered, or confused, or upset, or angry. Our ability to make smart decisions is impaired the most, when we need it the most. Bad decisions. Emotional decisions. They've dragged us into a war no pony wanted. They've pushed us to the brink of extinction. And if you're listening to this, beyond, damn it all to hell. Damn us all to hell. Sorry. I hate this whole thing. I wish the world was the way it was back when I was a filly. But wishes are just wishes. Damn it! I can't seem to get through one of these without going wildly off track. I'm sure you're wondering what, if anything, does this have to do with you? Why am I telling you this? Well, don't worry. There's actually a point. This isn't just the rantings of some stable tech pony who has already died. Haven't I? Your stable has a very exceptional design. Despite the official documents, the stable has no remote connection to stable tech whatsoever. Instead, replacing the normal overmare's position, we have fitted stable 29 with a Crusader class computer system. The Crusader class mainframe is the most advanced supercomputer ever created by Ponykind using the greatest available improvements in our Kano technology. The Crusader is capable of independent thought, creativity, and learning. We've only built three of these, and the other two are currently in possession of the Ministry of Arcane Sciences and the Ministry of Awesome, respectively. 
The goal of this social experiment is to remove the emotional, failable pony from the equation. To see if we can do better through a pragmatic and logical system of government that is not something subject to our own faults. As always, just in case something goes wrong, there is a backup. And that backup is you. Provided with this recording are the codes to shut down the Crusader mainframe in case of emergency. Doing so will unfortunately also shut down all the automated system. So this should be only done if the matter of life and death for the general population of the stable. There is an access junction between the security station and the VIP rooms through which you can access the Crusader mainframe. As a last resort, the programming of the Crusader mainframe can also be entirely overwritten via magical transfer mapping the brain of the pony into the mainframe itself. This would allow you to effectively become the Crusader, taking control of the automated systems yourself. However, this is untested, and the effects of the pony infiltrating this transfer are unknown. So really, I really, really don't suggest it. In any other circumstance, however, it is crucial that you keep to the ruse, as per the directives provided. Thank you, from all of us, from all of Equestria, best of luck, and may Stable 29 and all of its ponies live long and well. Finding the security access junction was easy. I was replaying the message again, this time in my ear bloom. It made no sense, but it still had the singular benefit of not being overwhelmingly evil. I had to know more. Pulling with a security panel, I found a maze of tubes and wiring, and set into it a small yellow-orange block box with a black jack point. It struck me that the last pony to try this was effectively electrocuted. Hooking my own pit buck to the junction could be a death sentence. Fortunately, I had another option. I pulled out Velvet Remedy's pit buck for the first time since shortly after I found her. It was a thing of beauty, but I realized it had never meant a pleasant thing to her. Holding it only by levitation, I jacked her custom pit buck into the junction. Moments later, looking through streams of data, one string caught my eye. Error detected. Water talisman functioning at 98% capacity. Analyzing damage. Chance of restoring water talisman to full functionality, 0%. Analyzing options. Service radiation levels, 1,300% above survivability level. Preservation of pony life requires water r rationing and a 0.02% reduction of stable population. Initiating water rationing. Analyzing population for most expendable, 0.02%. Initializing population reduction. The strength went out of me. I stared at what I was reading. My rage melted into cold despair. There are many more strings of similar data. Over the course of the season, the damaged water talisman continued to deteriorate, and every time the degraded de reached a new threshold, the crusader running stable 29 culled a portion of the population in a coldly calculating attempt to preserve pony life and the stable as a whole. After three months, the water talisman failed altogether. The Crusader acted accordingly to preserve pony life. I poured what was left of a bottle of apple whiskey down my throat, enjoying the burn. The rage had drained from me, replaced by a numbness that was even worse. I decided to escape this horrible place through the memory orb at least for a little while. Setting it down gently, I focused my magic on the orb. Instantly, I was overwhelmed by bright flashes, a horrible thudding, roar, and gut-wrenching nausea. The memory orb had decayed somehow, 
but I was trapped inside a nightmare of sensory feedback and vertigo. I tried to escape, but there was no way out. Then, the world righted itself. But it wasn't my world. I was quite certain I had vomited all over myself. And I wasn't myself. So I couldn't tell. All around me spanned a massive party. Colored lights, festive decoration, and a dance beat that grabbed hold of your soul and made you want to move. I was at the turntables, bobbing my head to the beat, and everywhere, ponies. Ponies dancing, ponies eating, ponies doing things in corners and behind potted plants that would make their parents blush and faint. A graceful aging, light blue pegasus pony with a rainbow colored hair fluttered towards the turntables with a slight swagger and looked a bit sploshed. Awesome beat, Vinyl Scratch, she grinned. Your rhythms always make for the best parties. She wore her years well. It must have been pretty damn cute in her youth. I wanted her hair. And whoa, was Vinyl Scratch checking her out? She held my gaze going up and down. No, wait. That's just head bobbing. Yeah, said a familiar looking orange pony with a cowboy hat on her yellow mane and red ribbons in her tail, matching her three apple cutie mark. She was significantly older than her statuette portrayed, and she looked even older than the news article. It had not aged quite so gracefully. I wonder if her looks were more from stress than years. Fluttershy and Rarity are gonna be hating to miss this. Her accent reminded me a lot of Calamity. The orange earth pony sauntered around the turntables, looking at the blue pegasus, who swayed lightly as she smiled back. Are you safe to fly home, Rainbow? Oh hell no! The red, uh, the rainbow mane pegasus clapped the orange one on the shoulder. I haven't left one of Pinky Pie's parties safe to fly in nearly 20 years now. The orange pony gave her an odd look. You ain't tried any of the harder stuff, have you? Hell no, Rainbow stomped a hoof as she repeated herself. You know, she dropped her voice, which had been getting loud. I don't touch that stuff. She held a hoof to her breast with slightly wobbly pride. Rainbow Dash doesn't need enhancements. The orange pony looked relieved. I realized I was looking at the mysterious mayor of the Ministry of Awesome, the one whose rebellion gave Calamity his title of Dashite. I didn't know what to think, although I had to admit she certainly had the right hair. I heard they've got stuff back there called Dash, Rainbow Dash said conspiracy, which Pinky says would make me even faster. She landed in a heroic stance, her voice filled with extra bravado. Of course, I don't do that stuff, AJ. Dash on Dash? That wouldn't just break the laws of Equestria. That would break the laws of physics. An apple green colted stallion trotted up and whispered something in the ear of the orange pony apparently named AJ. Rainbow Dash stopped with a stare. So, AJ, who's the new buck? You don't have to ask it like that, AJ bristled. Ah, uh, if you wanted some company, Rainbow Dash clapped the orange pony on her cutie mark, you could have just asked me. The earth pony fixed Rainbow Dash with a look. My barn door don't swing that way. Something stirred in me, and neither does yours. The stirring died. You're drunk, the orange pony added, unnecessarily, but accurately, stepping out of the way of a green mare, whose plate was loaded with cakes. Rainbow Dash just giggled. So, are you going to introduce me to a new buck friend or not? AJ rolled her eyes before introducing him. This year's Sergeant Steelhooves. Apple snacks. Serving with Big Macintosh. Apple's dear, this is Rainbow Dash, the old friend I wore, uh, told you about. 
No way. No way! Rainbow Dash echoed my thoughts, then proclaimed to derail them. You're dating a buck named Apple Snack? The Pegasus, who had just begun to fly again, collapsed on the floor, rolling in laughter. The elderly orange pony rolled her eyes. Not looking at her laughing companion, she nickered. Don't hurt yourself. Somewhere else in the room, an argument broke out. Applejack and Apple Snack. Rainbow Dash tried to get up again, but broke down in a fresh wave of laughter. Oh, it hurts too much. I was thinking that his title had to be coincidence. I'd know for sure from that voice, but so far he hadn't said anything. He was watching his date's old friend with a gracious, weary amusement. My sight was torn away from the two as Vinyl Scratch looked up at the balcony, where the argument I had barely noticed earlier was beginning to draw every pony's attention. I immediately recognized Pinkie Pie, although the purple unicorn who was trotting determinedly away from her was not familiar. Not this again, said Pinkie, bouncing after her. You wouldn't expect me to bake a cupcake without tasting it to make sure it's good, would you? I'm leaving, she said. I shouldn't have come. She was barely audible through the clamor of the party. Pinkie Pie's voice, however, could somehow be heard clearly over the intense rock music. Oh, don't be like that, Twilight! It's a party! Have fun! The unicorn glared forward, ignoring her until the surprisingly bouncy pony dropped herself right in front of the purple unicorn. Have fun! Have fun! Have fun! Have fun! Have fun! She sang it like a mantra. The unicorn stopped, one forehoof on the ground, and stared. She seemed to struggle with her inner urge. For a moment, events could have gone either way, but then she stomped on the hoof. I'm not having fun, Pinky, she said, her voice dangerous and loud. And you want to know a secret? Neither are. You. Pinkie Pie giggled. Of course I'm having fun. There's cake and ice cream and cupcakes and the best party music and drinks and party favors and... And these? The unicorn floated up a tin off a nearby table. I knew immediately what they were. Yep, especially those. The pink pony was nearly beaming and I heard Applejack grow next to me. Twilight opened the tin, turned it over, and spilling party time menthols all over the floor. Some bounced over the side of the balcony, some down the stairs. The pink pony gasped and jumped for them, scooping them up. Part of me wanted to join her, but I was just along for the ride. I'm sick of lying for you, Twilight scolded, scolded loudly, for covering for you with the princess. Every pony is, and I'm not going to do it anymore. Pinky looked up, with a glare, as she picked up her party time mentals. You didn't have to do that, you witchy twitchy rhymes with itchy. You're not a party pony anymore, Pinky. You're just an addict, like half the ponies at your parties. The purple unicorn stared back at the pink pony, unleashing a level of mad that had clearly been built up for some time. Well, this is it. I want my old friend back. I want my Pinky Pie. You are not her. But if you should happen to find her, give her a call for me. The song ended. The beat stopped. The whole room fell into silence. Twy- No! Don't twy me. It won't work this time. Either clean up and fess up. The unicorn took a deep breath, clenching her own eyes against what she was about to say. Well, this friendship is over. Twilight turned and walked away. The pink pony seemed to deflate. Even her hair fell limp. Besides me, or beside me, Applejack moaned again. Oh gosh, Twy. Rainbow Dash, who had long stopped laughing, flopped her wings. She's kind of right. Then the blue Pegasus slowly flew towards the exit. 
she'd still be Twilight out the door. Twilight turned back, looking not at Pinkie Pie. In a voice I'm not sure reached the balcony, she said, If you decide to be my Pinkie Pie again, really, do. I need your help. You know where to call. Then she walked out the door into what looked like a rainy Manhattan night and swung shut behind her. One thought hit me as I collapsed from the memory orb like I had been kicked in the stomach. In fact, I had vomited on myself. Leaning against the wall, I assured myself it's not that bad. But I have to be careful with you, I said to the party time mentals in my saddlebags. I can't let Calamity or Velvet Remedy get to thinking I have a problem with you. I don't want to lose my friends because they think I'm addicted. Footnote. Level up. New perk. Tough hide. Level 1. The brutal experiences of the Equestrian Wasteland have hardened you. You gain plus 3 damage threshold for each level you hold this, this perk you take.